We don't often talk about the story of Pua and Shifra, though their story is one of courage and metal, standing together against forces of evil seeking to destroy a nation. So we'll first take a look at where they lived, the country of Egypt. Then we'll explore the career they entered into and how their life and work prepared them for God's call when it came. Now Egypt was old by the time this story takes place. Theirs was a magnificent culture, military might, technological advances, great art, sophisticated society. In fact, the pyramids were probably showing some signs of aging when Jacob moved his clan, at Pharaoh's invitation, to the land of Goshen. It's difficult to tell when this story took place in history. However, counting backwards from Solomon's temple and working with the research presented in Exodus Myth or History brings us to a period of time when a Semitic people called the Hyksos began to settle in Egypt and eventually rose to power in the delta portion of Egypt. The Hyksos, called the Shepherd Kings, ruled in northern Egypt for around 200 years and built their capital city of Aris in Goshen. During this same time, Jacob and his family settled in Goshen where they became very wealthy. And the Israelites were fruitful and prolific and they multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now it seems Joseph had risen to power in the court of Amenemhat III and Joseph's clan came to find favor with the Hyksos pharaohs. Later, a new pharaoh rose to power named Tutmosis I and over the course of about 10 years, he managed to drive out the Hyksos and reclaim Egypt. And many scholars think this is the king of Exodus I. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. It would make sense for the new pharaoh to subjugate all the remaining Semitic peoples considering the close ties the Israelites had had with the Hyksos pharaohs, but even more so because the Hebrew people had multiplied greatly and grown strong. So pharaoh was facing a force he was afraid he could not control. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us. But this was a force Pharaoh also was afraid he could not do without and escape from the land. It seems the economy of Egypt had grown dependent on the Hebrew labor force and Pharaoh wanted to protect the economic asset of free labor while also protecting national security. So without realizing it, Pharaoh had entered into a power struggle with Almighty God, the God of the universe, a contest he had no hope of winning and Pharaoh's enslavement of the people was swift and severe. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. There is some pictorial evidence of Egyptians using Semitic slaves in brick fields, making bricks, hauling and building, and doing other forms of heavy manual labor, with Egyptian slave masters using heavy whips and carrying the long staffs denoting their rank. The cities they built were designed for the stockpiling of supplies and ammunition, probably along the eastern side of Egypt, sentinel cities to deploy the military for protection of Egypt's borders, but also uh, fortresses dotted along the Mediterranean going clear up into Canaan. Pharaoh reasoned that hard labor would slow down growth by sapping the people's strength and crushing their spirits, but it was a plan that did not work. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. And so the vicious circle began so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service and mortar and brick. And in every kind of field labor, they were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. In fact, Herodotus, a 5th century BC historian, said they even worked making irrigation canals. The Hebrew people became forced labor in every major work project. So stepping back, getting perspective, you and I are able to see that God had a dual purpose in allowing this heavy burden of slavery and oppression on God's people. First, God was preparing all Egypt for the contest that would come between God and the gods of Egypt and God would be revealed in ways that would sweep the whole known world, bringing forth a new nation and spreading the truth of God throughout Egypt and Canaan and the known world. God was also preparing Israel through their suffering to receive the rescue that the Lord had planned for them. 
The people would need to be strong. They would need to be able to thrive in the harsh conditions of the wilderness and to make the long trek to the promised land. It takes mindfulness, self-awareness, and God-awareness to reorient our vision to see what God is doing. Sometimes we have to get beyond the burden of pain, beyond the flood of anger and the trap of bitterness, to look for the good that God is doing. In this world there will be both suffering and blessing, but the hardship is designed to increase our faith and our trust in God. Difficult circumstances do not prevent God's blessing. Pharaoh said, or they will become more numerous. But God said, the more they multiplied. God's plans for us are always good, but they are not always comfortable. We tend to think comfortable is always the good. Anything uncomfortable must be bad. But that is just not true. Sickness, crises, trouble, hardship work into you and me what ease and comfort never can. In what ways might God be using uncomfortable circumstances or difficult people to grow us right now? So let's look at the career of midwifery. Finally, in growing frustration and fear, Pharaoh came up with the ultimate plan. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. Now we don't know if these women were Egyptians who headed up the guild of midwives, since it's unlikely there were only two midwives serving all those people, or if they were Hebrew, or if they were just given the region of Goshen. Their names were Semitic, not Egyptian, but... Josephus's Greek translation of Exodus implies they were not Hebrew. It does seem hard to believe that Pharaoh would have thought Hebrew women would have put the infants of their own people to death. And the nuclear family was the foundation for ancient Egypt's culture and society. Both the mother's and the father's genealogies were considered important to a person's family tree. And because family was so important, gynecology and obstetrics became an honored even sacred occupation. Ancient Egypt developed an excellent reputation throughout the region for providing good health care, particularly for pregnant and birthing women. And midwifery was practiced by mostly middle to low income women from the servant classes who were capable of a wide range of skills and services. Often this was a neighbor or a friend or a family member of the mother-to-be. And midwives learned their trade through apprenticeships assisting in all areas. Papyri from 5,000 years ago described treating sexually transmitted diseases and other ailments, boosting fertility, uh, providing contraception and prenatal care, as well as births and postnatal care. And though most physicians were men, some women did also become doctors. The earliest record of a woman physician in Egypt actually was named Peseshet, and she was thought to have had a medical school for midwives, and that goes back nearly 5,000 years. Often, as in many fields of that day, the secrets of their trade were kept within the family business, and midwives' children were married within the midwife community. Because Egyptian culture and antiquity had an open and unrestrained approach to sex, for those who were not yet married, midwives also provided a wide variety of ways to prevent conception including remarkably effective form of feminine contraception that would be used for the next 3,000 years or so throughout the known world. Both men and women, once married, longed to have families, so fertility tests were in high demand, as were pregnancy tests. So although prenatal care would not become a priority for the rest of the world for another few thousand years, it was in ancient Egypt. Women took care with their nutrition, they got outside to take in the sun and protect against miscarriage with a variety of herbal remedies, and their care had results. Female and infant deaths were lower in Egypt than in any other cultures where men got their needs met first. Spirituality was another important part of every woman's gynecological care. Egyptian midwives relied upon the help of several gods and goddesses to protect both mother and child and to bring labor to a successful birth, and to bring quick and full recovery for all. The god Bess was called upon to protect women during their pregnancy and birth. He was grotesque in order to ward off evil spirits. 
the goddess Hathor, was to protect the baby. Taureret protected pregnancy and labor and breastfeeding, and the goddess Isis was considered the overseer of all the healing arts. Pregnant women often went to mamsis, or birthing houses, attached to temples to give offerings, and also to pray throughout their pregnancies. Labor and birth were most often taking place on the cool of a house's flat roof, or within a structure created just for that purpose. Instead of lying down, women in antiquity often stood, or they squatted or kneeled to help with the cramps and with pushing their baby into the world. Birthing chairs were usually formed by brightly painted bricks, decorated with hieroglyphic inscriptions of the owner, and painted scenes of the mother and the baby and goddesses. The midwife would usually position herself between the mother's legs to catch the infant in her hands. Then other women would stand on either side of the mother to help her and to hold her and support her throughout her labor. Did you know that current research corroborates the advantages of giving birth in this position? There's a shorter and easier labor. It reduces tearing and other injury to the mother. There's a quicker delivery. There's less pain, shorter recovery, and reduced stress to the baby. There were several pain-killing potions women could drink, there were ointments to rub in, and shrieking was encouraged. In fact, all the women would help by shrieking in order to keep the evil spirits away. Among the midwife's tools was an intricately carved ivory amulet to place on the mother's belly. Sometimes midwives would place a dish of hot water under the birthing chair so the steam could help loosen the mother's pelvic muscles and ease her delivery and the birth of a baby was a joyful event. The families were equally delighted with a daughter as with a son, and the midwife would bring out her special flint knife in the shape of a fishtail to cut the umbilical cord and thus officially usher the baby into the world. Midwives returned at regular intervals to the home of new parents to provide postpartum and neonatal care, encouragement and practical help in nursing, and suppression of ovulation to give the mother time to heal. God equips those whom God calls. Pua and Shifra entered into time-honored and well-respected careers, starting their apprenticeships at a young age. And as they practiced their art, they grew in skill and care and in great reverence for life and in spiritual sensitivity. Eventually, they did so well, they were given the care of an entire people group in the region of Goshen. Unbeknownst to them, God was positioning them to save a nation and the lineage of one who would one day come to save the world. And so what was that calling of God? What did the midwives do? And this is the exciting part. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. This is the first instance in the Bible of civil disobedience. Working among the Hebrew people, both midwives had come to know and reverence God and to recognize God's love for and blessing of God's people. At the risk of their own lives, Pua and Shifra stood up in the way that they could for the lives of vulnerable women and innocent babies, the victims of a rapacious ruler who would do anything to consolidate and secure his power. Much later, in the Christian Testament, the apostles would teach on the righteousness of remaining within the protection of civil government by respecting authorities and obeying the laws. However, there is an authority and a law that supersedes all others, as the book of Acts recorded in the early years of the church. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had made the prisoners, Peter and John, stand in their midst, they ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must be the judge, for we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. Pua's and Shifra's healthy fear of God was stronger than their fear of disobeying Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world. He was also their authority, the king of their nation, their law, and he was also considered a god in his own right. But when Pharaoh confronted them, they told an unexpected story. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? 
and allowed the boys to live. The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous, and they give birth before the midwife comes to them. Was that true? I mean, it might have been. The word vigorous here was usually used in context with sheep and goats, and it describes how fast and easily they delivered their young. So it's possible the midwives were telling the truth. It's more probable that they told their assistants not to rush to Goshen when they got a call from a Hebrew family. Nevertheless, it appears they did not tell Pharaoh the whole truth. Clearly, these midwives were trying to avoid answering Pharaoh directly, so they probably commented on what was true without giving all the details, knowing their careers and probably their lives were on the line. Now, the Bible is explicit in stating that God hates lying. There are dozens of scriptures which talk about the evils of lying. God detests lying lips. God destroys those who tell lies. So God's response might seem a bit confusing. God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. A lot of ink has been spilled trying to tackle these puzzling verses through the lens of truth-telling versus lying. But I think that's asking the wrong question. A better question might be to ask what God looks at when viewing a person and their actions. The writer, through a device of repetition, tells us what mattered to God. The midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong, and because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. It was not for lying that God blessed midwives, but for fearing God and for moving with God's plan to multiply the Hebrews. God's affirmation of their motivation and for the risks they took on God's behalf came in three parts. First of all, Pharaoh accepted their story without any pushback, without any further questioning or investigation. Pharaoh just waved them on to continue their work. God continued to multiply the people. God gave them blessing of families of their own, a blessing they recognized came from God and not from the goddess Isis or from Hathor or from any other god or goddess from Egypt. God honors those who reverence the Lord. Of course, growth in character and growth in faith will enable us more and more to make wiser decisions, to be more courageous in doing right, and better able to do right in a right way. We'll become more reliant on God for protection and deliverance, but also more accepting of what seems like earthly disaster for spiritual and eternal gain. In the meantime, God reads our hearts and honors what we offer from reverence and a desire to move with God's purposes. Sometimes the honor God gives is tangible, like the families the Lord gave to the midwives. Sometimes that honor comes in eternity. Difficult circumstances do not prevent God's blessing. The Hebrew people were suffering under the nearly unbearable weight of enslavement, harsh treatment, and the forced infanticide of their sons. Under any ordinary circumstances, this would have meant eventual annihilation of the people and absorption of whatever remnants were left into the Egyptian culture. But the Lord came through powerfully for God's people, giving them strength to endure and even multiply. And God equips those God calls. Often you and I don't even know how God is preparing us for what lies ahead until we're there and we realize how our whole lives have been pointing to this very hour. And God honors those who fear him. Through the unexpected agency of the midwives assigned to work among the Hebrew people, God protected their sons and saved many of them. The midwives' courage and fear of God and their concern for the vulnerable enabled them to willingly take risks and obey a higher authority than even Pharaoh. Not only were Hebrew infant sons rescued, but God saw to it that the midwives also experienced the Lord's blessing. Millennia later, on the eve of his crucifixion, Jesus comforted and encouraged his followers with this same principle of truth. In the world, you all have anguish, affliction, burden, pressure, and tribulation. But rather you all be confident, be of good courage. 
I have prevailed and gotten the victory. I have overcome the world. No matter how hard it gets, how deep the valley we're walking goes, no matter how overwhelmed and overcome we might feel, God is not overcome. This story was going to get harder for the Hebrew people, but God was showing them early on, God has the victory. God always has the victory. And we who have put our faith in God through Christ get to be part of that victory. And along the way, we know God will provide through unexpected people and resources, through inspiration and ingenuity. In all our imperfections, God will provide for us and through us. Oh God, we thank you for Pua and Shifra's story and how you show us that no matter what flaws we have or imperfections, when we turn our eyes towards you, when we put our faith in you through Christ, when we're willing to move with your purposes, you will bless and provide. We pray this to the praise of your grace and great thanksgiving. Amen.